So I'm going to play a little video. So the key for us, um, and one of our approaches is we love all this large language chat evolution. Um, but what they've built, we think is a great appetizer. We want to deliver the main course, which is our expert minds that are multimodal for work. So this graphic here basically sums up um, our synthetic brain handles sight, sound, touch, motion planning, natural language processing, uh, uh, 3D spatial awareness. It also has a sense of uh, self-awareness, not consciousness, but it can tell the difference between itself and object in the room. And what's important is its neural net is capable of basically understanding and responding to complex human interactions, uh, both for the humans around it and the humans that help train it. So this was a uh, early test we did more than two and a half years ago it was a challenge, uh, which was, could you build a humanoid robot and have it do a two-handed task um, without it being set up? And that's exactly what we have here. So we see the robot taking an opener and opening up a Coca-Cola product. Maybe they can sponsor you guys. <laughs> One of our traits that's different than I think everybody else, um, but Boston Dynamic was the main company that preceded us. Uh, Honda and Toyota had dropped out. Um, we're the company that has created this new wave of robots from Elon Musk to Figure to Sanctuary on down. They all will be hiding in the lab for many, many years. Last year, we did a road show um, to expose the robot and have it work around and interact with humans around the entire planet. So we started at CES. Uh, having it interact, showing people how we used to train it, ha having it challenged. Um, and then we went all around the U.S., ended up in New York, where we did a week at the World Famous Explorers Club and their gala. And eventually, by October, we landed in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, where we were the number one featured tech at the Future Investment Initiative. Uh, and here on screen, you see the robot interacting with some sheiks. And one of the key is since we build the important thing about your mind uh, and what goes into it, that determined the form of the robot, as I said. Uh, and the base here is a wheeled base. It has special features to prevent it from tipping over, uh, in essence, a, a gyroscope function. It can go from five foot two to six foot two. The difference between this and a leg system, far more stable, insurable. It's not going to fall over and crush someone, and it will run 10 to 12 times longer than any leg system on the earth, period. We've been approached by a whole range of industries, from manufacturing, construction, hospitality, nuclear power plants, agriculture, of course, healthcare, logistics, you name it. The robot has very uh, articulate fingers, hands, wrists are very human-like. But also, besides being able to pick up large weights, it's fine enough to do this pinch of salt. We've been training it and testing it for a variety of things. This was a test for cellularity by Bob Harari, a publicly traded stem cell company. It can use any human tool. Um, and no one handed the robot these tools. It just went and picked them up. Strong enough to push that drill through uh, as many times as you want. It's working around a hot stove. Incredible. This was uh, very early in 2021, November, we, we had it tested at true pace. This is uh, in Vegas where we're showing you how we get the data into the robot. We let people challenge uh, to see if the robot with the human operator could do any task, pretty much it did. This is it in New York. This was doing singing in the rain, actually. So we found out at this facility here at True Pace, this is a place where people are 65 uh, to 99 years old. They get health, they get rehab, they get social, they get dental. Um, and everybody loved the robot. In fact, um, the robot was invited to a birthday party for a 99-year-old. Um, we got to come along, but it was the robot that was invited. <laughs> And, and why that's key is if you look at other people's robots, they're very Terminator-ish. They're very scary. 
or they're very cartoony. Um, our system has been designed so that it can be appealing to kids, old people, everybody. And of course, this is uh, making it rain with the robot. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's just a small sample. And quite literally, you're only limited by your imagination on this. All right. So uh, just to go through a little bit of, of the deck to give people a, a clear idea of what it is that we're building and why we're building it. I want to start off with a big question I always get, which is, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And am I going to destroy everybody's job? And the answer is no. Um, the, uh, the problem we're trying to solve is that there is a uh, developing world labor shortage. And it's going to be bigger every year. So right now, there's 30 million or so jobs throughout the Western world that don't have workers. There'll be 85 million by 2030. Our approach is to go out and capture the skills to train the AI brain and then be able to deploy it in our robots and down the road through APIs and other folks' robots and fill these jobs. Now, will there be some jobs that people lose? Obviously there will, um, but that's not the goal of the system. And I'll note to the audience that there's about 3.2 million people who die from occupational hazards every year. And uh, that doesn't mean they die on the job. It means that because of what they're exposed to, they end up dying. So it would be probably good to get rid of these dirty, dangerous jobs and have humanoids do them. Um, one of the areas we're focusing on as a first use case is uh, in the hospitals and clinics. Um, there are about 65 million healthcare workers worldwide. By 2030, they expect there to be a gap of about 18 million worldwide. And we're our goal here is just to do 10,000 um, by 2028, because I'd rather over deliver and under promise. So if we hit 100,000 or a million by then, fabulous. But even if we hit 10,000, that will be a home run for us. And how big is the problem? Well, last year, 80% of the hospitals lost money because the free market caught up to the hospital system. What does that mean? With too few workers, those workers suddenly realize that they can demand higher pay. So now what you have is a double whammy to the hospitals. They earn most of their money doing these, these operations and, and clinical, both uh, day operations and, and overnight stays. Uh, and they are doing fewer of them because they have less workers and each one they're doing is costing them more. That's led to a, a big loss to the hospitals. But it's also a loss to people because there are people who need to get uh, procedures who can't. Um, a very quick look at where we're at. We have a lot of experience in our team in terms of AI and robotics. Currently we have eight patents, 42 more to file. And to date we've raised actually over uh, $5.6 million uh, 97% of that is from accredited investors. And I've, I've discussed a bit about the AI brain, but I'll, I'll give you guys a deck in case you guys uh, want to take a look at it. What is the big value differentiation between us and everybody else? For, for us, it's because we think what's important is what goes into your brain and what goes into it. And all of our competitors who've come out since we launched uh, are focused on the human form, and in particular, legs. Uh, if you were to ask them why legs are important to do a job, they wouldn't be able to tell you. We did our first um, pilot case at True Pace, which was a community care. I showed some of that in a, in a video. What was really interesting here is the our main goal was autonomous humanoid robots, but we can use the same feature we use to train the robots to remobilize people. So imagine all the people who are uh, have a disability, they're, they're crippled from the waist down, maybe they're completely crippled and they can only move their head. Uh, you could jump into these robots and be able to live an active life. Um, or maybe you're 90 years old and uh, you wanna go play basketball against your grandson. In these systems, you can. One of the key things that doctors loved about this system was the ability not only to train it to be a nurse or a surgical assistant, but if they wanted to see their patients, that if this robot was in their home, 
or in a facility, they can jump in and have absolute continuity of care. So both functions are important. Our first lines that we're aiming to, to release is what we call CoboCom, CoboClean, CoboRep, and CoboTech. CoboCom is being a remote surgeon or expert into the surgical room, which now is done simply with screens. CoboClean is an autonomous robot that will clean the instruments and make sure that there are no biomaterials uh, on, on the instruments. Infections from uh, unsterilized equipment do happen and it's very costly both to the patient and to the hospital. CoboRep um, is basically the ability to bring in a surgical rep into the room and not have to have them there physically. And the first one we're doing for full on is a CoboTech, which is that person who transitions instruments back and forth to the doctor. Now, why that is interesting is because it's a very high level problem to solve with very complex uh, haptics. So it's challenging us on our AI haptics that we want to develop. But once we lock this down, being able to then make a, a autonomous cooking robot or autonomous cleaning robot or autonomous laundry robot becomes very simple. And uh, in terms of our business model, in today's world, we don't have a huge budget. Most corporations don't have huge hardware budgets. What they have is huge labor and overhead budgets. And you can't, if you're running a corporation, just go over to the guys who have the labor budget and say, hey, give me, can I, can I get $10 million from you guys so I can buy some robots? Um, that's, that's not gonna happen. So what we've done is create the best for the customers and quite frankly, for, our, for us and our investors, which is robots as a service and AI as a service. So uh, if you need a, a worker, our plan is, is if it's between 50 and 100K of cost, then we will lease you that robot at that cost for one employee. These will run between seven and 10 years. Um, the cost that we, we're seeing on the bomb is less than $50,000 for the robot. So in essence, after the first year, you'll have paid for the cost of the hardware. And the customer gets a huge labor savings because what you have to keep in mind is a humanoid robot of this sort can work 24 hours and uh, seven days a week. And so a lot of hospitals have three shifts. Even those who have two shifts save 74%. Um, and so you get a giant labor savings, but you also get infinite scalability or descalability if you don't need them. Uh, you get the ability to have, if one of them makes a mistake, all of them the next day know not to make that mistake. You don't get any drama, you get no strikes, you don't get any employment taxes, et cetera, et cetera. So the benefits uh, to, to folks are immense and it will go across all areas. Our go-to-market is, is quite um, uh, detailed, but there's a simplification, which is we're going to surgical first and then elder care and um, AI brain-driven dementia care, and then manufacturing process applications, retail, et cetera. Um, our goal is to IPO in, in four or five years. Roadmap is, co is too much for me to discuss right here. And we're currently actually uh, out to raise $40 million. So I'm going to end it there. Um, and in fact, we today is, is the last day of our uh, WeFunder campaign. Um, and we may or may not open another one down the road. Uh, we opened our campaign uh, not essentially to raise money, but to allow the, the everyday investor to get in. I would have loved to invest in Apple before it became public. Um, Peter Diamandis and myself and Ray were staunch advocates uh, for crowdfunding to become possible. So for a decade before it was possible, we were speaking on it. And that's one of the reasons we, we opened the campaign.